All right. We are ready for our next talk. Uh, Shivei is going to talk to us about security and observability uh, using Cilium and the kernel and another eBPF <laughs> talk. So it goes along the theme. All right. Yeah. Welcome, Shivei. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and again, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak over here. Uh, super excited for Cloud and Vertex and KubeCon. Um, of course, my day didn't really start off idly. I lost my baggage. So still kind of worried about whether I'll be able to get it, but uh, all good. Uh, my co-speaker couldn't make it because of Visa. So I we have pre-recorded his part of the talk. But yeah, I mean, going along with the uh, theme of EPBF, we'll have another application of EPBF specifically towards service mesh over here, and we'll see how service mesh and the use of eBBF complement each other in order to achieve security, uh, reliability, and observability for your applications that you deploy to, your, to, the, to the clouds. That's what the main takeaway will be for today's presentation. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so my co-speaker will be giving his introduction in the recorded video. But I'm a developer relations engineer at MilliSearch, and I've also been a Google Summer of Code mentor for the Mesh Street project, which is currently incubated under the CNCF. It's, it's a service mesh interface hub, and you can basically load test multiple different types of service mesh on uh, Meshri. So I also uh, co-founded the MeshMate program, which essentially allows uh, developers who want to get started with service mesh uh, to take their first ever journey into the world of service mesh. Uh, so we kind of do one-to-one -one mentorship. So it's completely open sourced. Uh, yeah. So if you want to connect with me, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. But uh, the agenda for today is that first we look at some of the main issues that we commonly see with microservices. Now, of course, a lot of you coming in from a cloud native background might be already aware of them, but just wanted to set that as the uh, starting context for those who might not be aware of them. And then we'll be moving uh, gradually towards understanding some of the limitations that come with service meshes and how tools like EPBF and Cilium really help with those. But at the same time, we'll also look at some of the issues that we face with EPBF and Cilium and how we can complement them with the help of the service mesh and the combination of EPBF and, uh, and the future road ahead for these technologies. So starting with the uh, monolith versus uh, and microservices, right? I'll not go too deep into it because I assume that a lot of you might be knowing uh, regarding these, but on a very high level context, microservices are an advancement to your monolith concept. So with monolith, all of your different application layers, whether it's like the different functionalities, were bundled under one single application. And of course, the biggest issue that we found with that was that if there was even one single point of failure with one of the services, it, it essentially impacted your entire application. With microservices, since uh, each and every application or each and every service is standalone, and it's having its own database, its own networking, so you can really make your application much more manageable. Manageable. So if, even if one uh, of your particular services goes down, you'll still be able to run your application without having a major overhead by having one, that one single point of failure. So of course, service mesh, uh, these uh, microservices were a huge advancement in comparison to these uh, monoliths, right? And of course, there are some limitations that do come with uh, the microservices, especially when you start to see uh, not just one, but you might have 100 or 200 different types of microservices. Services. And primarily, if we take a look at the three major challenges that we'll also kind of look at and tackle with the help of technologies such as Cilium and EBBF. So the first one is security, right? So typically, whenever you are interacting with multiple microservices, you're using something like MTLS, which allows you to very securely transfer the information, uh, encrypted in information between your microservices. Now. It's all good if you're having 5, 10, 15 microservices. But let's say if you scale it up to 100, 200 microservices, then it will become very difficult to keep track of the different uh, security parameters of the private keys that you might be using in order to be able to successfully uh, do that secure tr uh, transmission. And that kind of then relates to the reliability as well. Because if you are increasing the number of microservices that you have within your entire infrastructure, then uh, reliability of maintaining these 
uh, services will also become difficult because let's say if there are some issues when it comes to some of these uh, services, then it can become very difficult to track which particular service might be uh, causing that issue, right? So as you scale up your microservices, it becomes difficult in a regular context to maintain the reliability. And that, of course, then also boils down to monitoring and logging of your services uh, because you need a robust tool that can very easily manage between all the different microservices that you have in your infrastructure and then also reliably ensure that you get your logs and metrics from each of these uh, uh, microservices and then also from the intercommunication that takes place between the microservices. So what we see is that as you scale up these microservices, the three fundamental issues that we see are in the space of security, observability, and reliability. So as we process or we kind of uh, go further in today's session, we'll see how each one of these particular uh, major draw, uh, like you know, issues uh, with scaling up your microservices are addressed with the help of tools like EBBF and Cilium. So uh, with this, uh, I'll move on to the pre-recorded part. So I'll request if we can run the video. Hello, folks. How are you? So we are going to talk more about security and observability for all applications and how you can combine the user kernel powers. So we know like various facts are recently shared uh, by the my friend, good friend, Shiva. So uh, going forward, let me introduce myself. So I'm platform advocate at Solo.io. I'm founder of various communities like Keep Up, DevOps community, developer relations community, and uh, my goal is to just create a community where everyone can get all their doubts regarding anything like DevOps, if they want DevOps uh, and cloud native doubts, and if they have any queries about the same, they can directly reach out to DevOps community. Same for the developer relations, same for the keep up for the trainings and jobs and opportunities. So I'm also available on the Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn portfolio, uh, my own. Uh, and like, if you have any doubts and if you have any questions regarding the cloud native today's talk and various things, you can directly reach out to any of finals. So I host some podcasts on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and uh, different websites, uh, which is known as Cloud Radio Talks. I had various uh, folks from all over the world. You can go and check it out. So moving forward, uh, so as we know, like uh, our Shiva has already introduced you to the Cloud Radio security and observability and uh, what, what is the monolith microservices and what is the challenges in the microservices so introducing service mesh so service mesh is something you can say like it is a transparent infrastructure layer that manages the communication between your microservices so what actually it is that so when you are dealing with the microservices it is like there are various things to handle like you have to make it secure you have to uh, why use the service mesh to uh, to better uh, use the better capabilities of these things, uh, you can increase security. You can use the you, you can use the visibility. You can use the reliability, and it provides everything. So if you have large number of microservices kind of a uh, infrastructure and something, then yeah, service mesh is something for you. And uh, so previously it was like you have uh, so what happens when service communicates with each other then it was really tough like you can't actually implement the business logic into it so what is business logic so if you are familiar with kubernetes pods and structures and if you have developed developed uh, deployed the application services you might have seen the pods attached to it where capabilities are shared right so that pods where you share the capabilities is called as business logic so while operates uh, operator work independent of dev cycles to provide a more resilient environment uh, as we know. So moving forward, as we can see, so what actually is a uh, Istio networking and what actually is Istio uh, service, mix, right? So when, uh, why we are talking about this? So when you see the diagram of our uh, Istio, so what happens? Uh, it talks to control plane, then the data plane and different data planes. So Control plane is sitting outside and it checks everything. Like it, it is the only one who handles everything. Like uh, if you want to track the matrix, you can go through it. If you want to, uh, uh, if you want to put some capabilities, you have to just contact the Denver proxy, which is attached to the your uh, services in the data plane. 
and uh, that capabilities will, will be add on so similar kind of a thing we are explaining here so your entire uh, like entire application container traffic flowing and uh, various capabilities are done through the anwar proxy so anwar proxy is something which was introduced by the lift and now it is open source available on the cncf projects uh, as you can see, it is the one of the best boxes around the world and it is widely used everywhere. So what actually is the Anwar proxy? So it, it allows you to add the capabilities to your application to the sidecar, which we say. So network traffic is transparently redirected to proxy every, every time it is the same. So you can add the TCP, UP, uh, UDP connections, so in this video, uh, for now, we are dealing with the TCP connections, but we can add UDP also. It is not different or something, but talking more on this same side, uh, if you want to, or uh, if you want to communicate to the IP tables, if you are to mention something, you have, you can do it easily through the SEO. So traffic redirection is achieved by IP table rules, as we say, so created a power startup. So what we are seeing here, so if you have the use case you now around like creating the init container and uh, so if you want to redirect the uh, your traffic through the IP tables, then init container is the one. But if you don't want to deal with the same and if you want to go through the CNI, uh, CNI, well, well, and it's like CNI traffic redirection kind of thing, then Istio CNI is for you. So there are other things also. So redirect rules in the pods network namespace uh, point inbound and outbound packets to the correct pods, uh, ports opened by the sidecar. So what it actually saying. So if if your sidecar is opening some opening for uh, your services and kind of thing, so we can mention the inbound and outbound packets into the your network namespaces and for we can redirect some rules whenever we want. So sidecar processes the request handles policies for the correct direction destination. So what actually it is saying, like if you want something reliable, if you want something visible, if you want something uh, more secure, observe, uh, it is easy to observe, uh, observe the things, then yeah, this is the way you can go with the Istio service meshes for you. And Istio service mesh is the one of the service mesh which is widely used everywhere and it is most popular one. Recently, it is actually caught into the incubating project for the CNCF. So it has a vast future and various capabilities. And uh, as we can see, like there are numerous things are launching day and day. Uh, so moving forward, we can talk about the service mesh, your benefits and limitations. So what actually it is. So as you can see, Envo is the most powerful and it is really rich the l7 proxy so that is the only thing right you you can get entire things from the your uh, l7 proxies and uh, uh, native support for various application protocols and to end encryption with strong workload identity so what actually is a mutual tls mtls what it is so uh, as you can see like you have application one application two and if you want to uh, so application one is like say say like let's slash uh, dog and application two is a slash cat. So if you don't want to access the application uh, to slash cat, then you can easily mention some policies and uh, application one will be accessible to your uh, get request and post request kind of thing, but this can't be accessible. So yeah, it is then easily done and it is the most secured way uh, Istio works. So fine grained security at L7 as we discussed. So rich telemetry so what is rich telemetry you can easily get the scrap the data and metrics and uh, you can use it whenever you want uh, and you can use it for the various protocols so easy life cycle management with sidecar proxy architecture as we can see so whatever capabilities you want to add you can add it easily on the proxies if you want to do any uh, new things like uh, if you want to uh, so one thing only like most uh, uh, so Things are like all features are relying on the sidecars, so not getting bypassed. So what happens? What actually it means? So it is one kind of a limitation which I think, yeah, it is there. It is there. So 
whenever you want to add some capabilities into your uh, application then you have to highly reliable on the, your sidecar because entire traffic will go to the sidecar only similarly for the ip table so direction only works for the tcp traffic so as we said like uh, istio recently works for the tcp only but in the future yeah udp can be added it is not like the issue but injecting sidecar require application for restore it is not actually the use case i would say but uh, thing is like you need to restart your pod whenever you want to add any application if you want to add any new sidecar or something then you have to restart your pod but as we are dealing with various clients and various uh, customers we never face this problem because they they keep their uh, they keep their applications running like they do istio service mesh running so they don't want to restart their pods so yeah but still it is a kind of a limitation i resource consumption so if you are uh, using the sidecar on the application one application two different services different jobs then yeah for sure your resources will be consumed more your latency will increase as you are uh, so think like this application one is traveling or uh, talking to the application two through the envoy proxy to the service <laughs> so and we will see one then you know, and we will see two and then to the application two so it is like long long latency required so that is the thing so what actually is the ebpf so linux technology which enables users to run custom programs uh, program sandbox in the kernel so what actually it means so as you can see uh if you want capabilities of the users uh, kernel uh, user space and kernel space kind of thing if you know so uh, think about this uh, there is a javascript program there is python program kind of thing so if you want only the uh, user space like kind of capabilities then yeah you go there right so if you want both if you want kind of a thing where you can achieve both of these things using the kernel capabilities then yeah ebpf is something for you so ebpf is just extended bpf so what is a bpf it is a berkeley packet filter uh, which is used for the filtering your packets uh, you can uh, remember there is a tcp dump com uh, command you use in the linux terminal right so that is the one so it based on the uh, test hook point so whatever you want to trigger in by like certain events which we call as a k prop type programs uh which you can attach to the kernel functions and when it is executed then when the function is called uh, so that is your uh yeah you can call the points and stuff so bpf programs are verified to be safe won't crash the kernel guaranteed to return no infinite loops and only access specific space sections of a memory etc so yeah as we can know that so why bpf so as we are dealing with the istio service mesh as we are dealing with the cilium as we are dealing with the envoy proxy we knew that right networking security observability we are already using it at the user side yeah, we, so why not to look for something for the kernel side also right that is that is what we are looking today right so yeah ebpf is something where you can use the classic bpf means like it is tcp dump uh, yeah so you can use a linux networking stack so it is it is there for the networking it is there for the tcp udp and it is there for the your capabilities on the what we say uh, layers in your osi right so security security is something uh, you can use it to uh, like do allow the gate request not allow the post request kind of thing you can monitor the sensitive information you can track the metrics uh for the observability you can get a uh, scrap that things you can put it whenever you want you can specific uh, you can specify some hook points and trace points and yeah that kind of a thing you can do and we call it as a ebpf based monitoring and it is really efficient like you you can specify the raw events as they happen in the terminal so it is the best capability we can see and talking on the telemetry side it is just uh, i think ebpf is something we will focus more towards in the future and from now only right so talking about the ebpf architecture as we can see here ebpf program has like uh, it generates some, it goes to the compiler 
LLVM compiler and it generates the EBPF byte course. That course is loaded to the verifier, your kernel space, and then it goes to Java, uh, your JIT compiler. And that is converted into your machine code after that. And that machine code is something like you can call is it a direct that happens like props, tracers, sockets. The sockets is something uh, you can look out for the traffic things and stuff in your networks, right? So that maps uh, maps is something uh, which converts these things and gives you to the output. So output is generally available to the user space and you can use it as a user space. So generally eBPF, uh is written into the various languages uh c c language and your uh rust rust people are using it right and nowadays people are looking for the better capabilities so we will discuss this in the next uh talks and somewhere because i am really excited on talking about that things also but uh Tilium... yeah so talking about the leverage in user and kernel powers together. So that is today's goal, right? So what can happen when you can use the users and kernel powers together and you can achieve the various things, right? Uh, because now... Perfect. So, um, of course, like um, you heard from my co-speaker about what exactly is a service mesh and how that actually helps overcome some of the limitations that we usually see with microservices and also introducing EPBF into this entire mix and some of the security capabilities that you get in hand from the kernel capabilities that come with EPBF. So, talking about uh, Cilium, right? So, talking about an introduction to service mesh, an introduction to EPBF. This is kind of the natural transition into understanding why not create a service mesh or a tool that leverages the power of EPBF that helps us to bring capabilities such as your security observability into the service mesh directly. And that's what Cilium kind of really started off as. And one of the primary goals uh, that EBBF kind of targets is that A, it will provide a lot of scalability as well as we'll cover some of the features of Cilium. But the biggest one is that it can actually inject network uh, security policy without having to make any uh, changes as such to your uh, entire code or to the configurations that you may run in your community's nodes. So talking about some of the major uh, advantages or the major features of uh, Cilium, right? So the first one is uh, the service mesh load balancing. So Cilium essentially provides you load balancing right of the uh, of the bat, and uh, again because it's using a standardized Kubernetes ingress controller, so that allows you to basically very easily set up your uh, Cilium agents inside of your individual Kubernetes nodes, and you can very easily manage them inside of a distributed Kubernetes cluster. And there's no limitation in terms of setting up multiple clusters, so it actually scales up pretty nicely as you scale up more number of nodes in your cluster, or you might have a multi-modal cluster. Stuff. And then the second one is that uh, it also provides a lot of different uh, network policies as well. So it has the standard communities uh, network policies and the Cilium network policies that allow not just for uh, identity-based policies, uh, then also for your global set of policies, but also for uh, the policies that are enforced on your application layer, so, such as like your HTTP requests or gRPC-based requests. So you can get policies not just for the application layer, but also for authentication, identity as well. And also, like you know, you can define global-level policies for your entire architecture. And then, of course, uh, when it comes to scalability, so I think like the biggest one is um, that when we want to scale up your regular microservices, we found a lot of issues, uh, primarily when you're uh, hosting them on a Kubernetes cluster. But the great thing with Cilium is that since it comes inbuilt with a CNI, then that what that allows us to do is that it has full capability with uh, scaling up any of your Kubernetes clusters. So essentially, you can run your Cilium agents on top of each and every node. And the more, uh, if you want to increase the number of nodes inside of your uh, cluster, you can very easily just spin up new agents that will be able to manage uh, your multi-cluster network. And there will not be scaling, uh, there will not be an issue as you scale up your uh, network horizontally. 
And of course, uh, the most important one is that you can get very easy access to metrics as well, even though you might have a lot of different uh, agents. So these agents, these Selim agents are able to communicate between each other, and uh, you're able to get logs based on each and every node as well, at, at a node level, with the help of these Selim agents. Because they're able to spin out, or they're able to spit out these metrics that you can very easily uh, manage with the help of Prometheus or uh, any other uh, logging tool that you might want to use. So of course, like these are the major uh, capabilities that we covered. So that includes the uh, load balancing, the network uh, policy troubleshooting and monitoring, and the network policies creation and the uh, CNI. Uh, and of course, uh, there are some limitations, right? So since Cilium is still, I would say, not a fully evolved project, so of course you do get uh, kernel enforcement because it uses eBPF to inject your security uh, capabilities inside the node itself. Uh, but there are some limitations, and those are primarily related to your L7 and specifically related to the policies that are defined for fine-tuning your L7 policies. And of course, the other one is uh, the weakness with respect to identity-based services. So those are somewhat that will be uh, taken care of as you combine both your kernel and uh, yeah uh, your kernel and your user experience together, which um, again we'll be covering in the remaining video. So you can play the video. What can happen when you can use the users and kernel powers together and you can achieve the various things, right? Uh, because now you can work at the user space for the elf, like some capabilities are there only for the L4, right? And uh, some capabilities are there for the L7 only. So what can be happen when we both connect these things and we, whatever are the drawbacks in the one, whatever are the drawbacks in the one, we can combine them and we can solve everything, right? So that's why we are looking into this space. As you can see, uh, what happens in the current Istio sidecar reduction, whenever application goes to uh, talks to the Istio proxy, it goes to the socket and then uh, socket is the one who goes to the network stack. So it is really uh, going to that, that application and uh, everything is dependent on the Istio sidecar, right? It redirects the sockets. But what happens if we skip the network stack? It is entirely removed and eBPF is the one who will talk to the various things. So yeah, it is really right uh, right thing. Means previously it was not that tough or something, but it just accelerates your path and you don't have to focus on the minor things. Now you can give some push towards it, we can say, right? So same with the observability with your ICO sidecars. So previously, as you can see, if you have the sidecar, then you can scrap the application, uh, STO, NY matrix easily and put it to the Prometheus, your observability, whatever you use, right? So similarly, it is shown in the node one, like pet store is there and STO proxy is there and it is scrapping the data, right? But in the node two, as you can see, there is no sidecar, right? So how will it is scrap? Similarly, without STO sidecars, what happens, scrap, it just app metrics, uh, it is perhaps. Uh, so what happens, like enough data, uh, what is the issues, right? Can we use the BPF for gathering additional data? What we can do? So here it is done. So here's the answer for you. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you can directly uh, scrap the application Istio and more matrix from the eBPF. And similarly, it is gathered by the BPF programs. And what happens, it generates for your non-mesh workloads, custom matrix for mesh workloads, and scrap via standard Prometheus infrastructure. So if it is like whatever it is needed, it scraps the non-mesh. Uh, whatever it is needed, it scraps the me mesh workloads, right? And it passes on to the Prometheus, and yeah, your desired things are achieved. So with the eBPF, we can solve various capabilities which was needed. Right. Similarly, looking ahead, as you can see, Istio and EBP are both exciting technologies. I really know and vouch for it. And individually provides a lot of benefits, to, but can be layered together for even enhanced functionality, as we talked about layer four and layer seven, uh, depending on the 
how we can combine them and use for the user kernel powers combining to the better better results and better performance so is you recently launched ambient mesh and yeah tolo and google is the one who like uh, deal with entire thing and they were uh, it's like we were really working extensively on this and we can talk about uh, it is the big thing like you don't have to now restart your pods <laughs> when you use the ambient mesh and there are various things right so just check it out like what is ambient mesh and how it works and if you want to know more you can check my previous talks also it is that so lots of exciting development happening in this space and reach out to feedback and questions uh, yeah go ahead and if you have and you can reach out to my own handles also right thank you and yeah, i'll be open to questions but what we just want to cover from this particular talk it is more of a beginner friendly talk for those folks who might not have been from a traditional service mesh background but the main capability that we want to demonstrate is that how you can leverage the power of eppf in your existing is to based networks and get those additional metrics and security uh, with the help of the kernel capabilities that come with eppf so yeah uh, with that i'll be open to questions now right looks like no questions so thank you so much you can reach out to me or rohit on our handles and yeah uh, i hope that you have a wonderful rest of cloudinary physics and uh, kubecon thank you thank you